everybody wants to fly fighter jets and uh, right out of high school I thought uh, I would be able to just join the Air Force and, uh, and start the game but you had to be a commissioned officer and go through college didn't have that completed at the time so I enlisted became a mechanic first on F-16s figured work around the fighter jets would give me incentive to get off my bottom and complete the training uh, and found out uh, sometimes the fighter jock or the pilot position uh, it's not quite what you want it to be and uh, I met my wife at the time and uh, figured I'd have an opportunity to fly as an enlisted crew member and that's where I went to flight engineer school. I had the opportunity to go to Altus, Oklahoma and train on a cargo aircraft called a C-141 um, and in 94 we switched over to the uh, KC-10 here at McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. I had a friend who actually uh, was able to fly and took me up flying so it was really a natural high and gave us uh, the itch if you will to continue. I've been in the Air Force for 23 years right now. I've been flying for about 19 of it. Uh, initially was an aircraft mechanic on the F-16 and then cross-trained to the flight engineer program. As a crew member, as part of the KC-10, uh, we show up and do a uh, pre-flight of the aircraft and get the aircraft ready. We do all the systems and subsystems check, which is what you see here, uh, make sure everything is operational uh, for when the pilots are showing up to the aircraft. They're ready to start to push buttons and us be able to take off. We verify the flight data and make sure we have enough gas on board to complete the mission. Uh, we are basically always required for the safe operation of the KC-10. And usually when we go flying for a, a crew sortie or a at what we call a fighter drag. It's usually about a four to five day period um, when we're able to stay together with the full crew um, and complete the actual, uh, we call it again, fighter drag, taking fighters overseas over the water. Uh, it's a full day, go into crew rest, uh, and then continue on if we need to, depending on where the location is. The flight engineer training is a little bit lengthy. I mean, there's obviously phases or steps. We need to initially go to uh, Altus, Oklahoma for our basic aerodynamic programming and understanding performance. Then we start to learn all the different systems and subsystems. And uh, those take several weeks and blocks, if you will, is what we call them. Uh, and you progress. Then you get out of the schoolhouse and train in simulators as well as uh, wooden Indians, we call them, which are the, 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 the flight decks that have switches but not really operational uh, uh, gauges and stuff. Uh, after that, you went to an, an actual unit and trained uh, through phases of um, upgrade to, to, you, to you get your qualification. Aero TV is brought to you by... From the mountains to the prairies. to the landings that we love. Garmin SVT, synthetic vision technology. The flight engineer position I think is great. It's one of the best enlisted positions. Uh, the boom operator's job is, is very cool as well. Uh, being part of the uh, crew, obviously as a third set of eyes or a fourth set of eyes in the flight deck uh, is extremely important, I believe. Obviously, there's more, more valid input for what we call the CRM, or Cockpit Resource Management. Um, so we tend to back each other up, and if somebody's having a bad day or just doesn't make sense, we can always, uh, with experience and age, and um, I guess quell those differences, if you will, and help, help a safe flight. My role, basically, as a flight engineer is what we call a Systems Performance and Technical Advisor to the pilots. Um, what that really means is I maintain and operate all the systems required. When we're ready to do an air refueling, the boom operator will go to the back ARO compartment in the air refueling station and he will plug or make contact with the receiver aircraft. As a flight engineer, I then control the fuel offload and maintain center of gravity based on fuel requirements and our condition of flight. Um, so it, it's a pretty important position. Uh, I, again, control environmental systems. Of course, uh, I react to a situation if uh, a subsystem or system fails. And of course, some of the scariest things are when we have emergencies or abnormals. But we do practice them fairly often. Every three months, we do a, uh, a refresher simulator, and we go through those, uh, those drills, if you will. So we, we tend to get comfortable in those procedures and hope not to ever get in them. Uh, I was refueling F-16s for numerous years. And prior, when I first enlisted in the Air Force, I was an F-16 mechanic. So once I got my incentive flight, I was able to tank uh, or receive gas from the KC-10, which were my buddies and uh, friends of mine. So it was, it was very enjoyable and very memorable. One of the best things about being part of KC-10 World and the crew member concept really is that uh, it doesn't really matter uh, rank, it's qualification. Uh, as, a, as a team member, we become part of a good team and we, the repertoire is there, uh, we respect each other uh, and we listen to each other. Again, somebody may have a, a, a fantastic input that may need be or more experience or situation that someone else has not been uh, involved with. So uh, when you're first training on an aircraft, 
one of my, uh, I guess, most memorable experiences becoming a flight engineer was the intimidation factor, thinking, can I really do this? It is quite intimidating. It's a large piece of machinery, uh, and I guess it's an inherently dangerous uh, game. According to my family, they're not too thrilled with it, but it's exciting for me and uh, very rewarding and challenging. I believe the KC-10 uh, tanker community, um, like any part of the Air Force, has its own job, has a specific need. Uh, fortunately, we're able to do a little bit more than just air refueling. We're able to move cargo and passengers as well. So being able to shuttle the troops back and forth when needed, uh, as well as supplies, whether it's uh, packaged goods from home or mail uh, or belongings versus ammunition or whatever, um, it, it's very rewarding to be able to support that. So obviously we each have a piece in the game, and uh, it's, a, it's a global challenge, and uh, it's very demanding. So it's a very rewarding job. Aero TV is brought to you by Cirrus aircraft have always been easy to fly. Now they're easier than ever to buy. A complete line of ownership programs gives you everything you need to purchase, trade, finance, lease, insure, and warranty your Cirrus. There's even an ownership program for non-pilots. The Cirrus Access Pilot can teach you how to fly or fly the plane for you. Find out more at www.cirrusdesign.com. Cirrus, for the love of flying. It's very simple for me. When I saw lots of dials and gauges like any little kid, I was in very much awe and to find out that, that you can control this big piece of machinery it was, was pretty, uh, very appealing to me. I used to get space magazines and read all about it and I thought maybe I'll be an astronaut. And then I found out just how difficult and how the odds are way stacked against me to be an astronaut. Um, and, and so I took a path that was uh, to the heavies, which allows me to fly all around the world and, and see great things, which, which I enjoy. I've been in the military for 17 years, and I got commissioned back in 1991, and, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm still enjoying it, and I think I'm going to keep going until they kick me out. When I finished pilot training, I was lucky enough to get to pick what airplane I wanted to fly. Um, nowadays, they tell you what you're going to fly. I went through a narrow window of time where I actually, uh, based on how I finished in my class, was able to pick what I wanted to fly, which is a uh, a lot of people will look at that as a very lucky opportunity. And uh, what I picked was an original assignment to fly C9s, which is the DC-9, and it's a medevac airplane. I flew those over in Germany for three years and, and uh, through the Kosovo and the Tuzla-Bosnia conflict and did some very, very rewarding work. And I picked a C9 with a KC-10 follow-on, which is this airplane. I, I came to uh, back from overseas in Germany in 1999, and I've been in the KC-10 since 1999. When I was a kid and, and thought about being an astronaut, I guess by today's standards, looking back on that, it's a kind of maybe a lonely life, and, uh, and this is a very social atmosphere. I have a, a pilot, co-pilot, flight engineer, boom operator, a crew. I'm constantly out, and the, the chance to get to meet people all over the world is the most rewarding thing for me. We are directly supporting uh, the fighter aircraft that are airborne and the people on the ground that need our help. A lot of folks don't realize, I mean, we, from 1991 in Gulf War I, there were KC-10s there, uh, through Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, over Afghanistan and Iraq, there's a KC-10 there ready to pass off fuel to a, a fighter who needs it or another heavy aircraft uh, who needs that fuel desperately. So uh, right now while we're speaking and doing this interview at Oshkosh, there's somebody over both combat zones at all times. Um, refueling the fight, bringing fuel to the fight. So that's, that's pretty awe-inspiring to know. What it's like to emotionally fly the plane is becoming easier and easier for me the older I get, only because uh, every time I pull back on the stick, I know that uh, the amount of times I'll get to do that is getting less and less. So I always remind myself and pinch myself that people would kill to be in the position that I'm in, or they would be very envious of uh, to be in the position I'm in. And uh, that, to me, every time I pull out on the runway and get ready to take off, I get a little bit of a smile and realizing that, that somebody's paying me to do this and it's a very rewarding job.